Hello and welcome to our master class. I'm very excited about another chance to be with you and to just have some time today where we can be learning with and from each other. So if you are here with us live, type in a hi, a hello, <laughs> let me know where you're coming from. Um, and if you're watching the replay, you can do the same thing. You can go into the comment box as we go through our master class today. If you have questions, if you have comments, please just type them in the comment box and we will make sure before we end that we've answered everybody's questions. So I'm going to do my cere ceremonial um, look on my phone and make sure that we're out here live um, because there's a delay. So sometimes I don't see us, <laughs> but we're really here. So it's kind of magical. I don't see us. So if somebody's hearing my voice, can you let us know if we're live? I'm going to wait just a minute. Maybe I'll type a comment myself. <laughs> or so if you can, when you come on the comment box, I can see your name. But can you put in the city or the state that you live in? Because that's always fun to see. Um, and then also you could type in the comment box, what are you hoping to get out of our show today? And I'm going to message somebody and see if they see us live. <laughs> because I don't see it on my phone. So we'll see. I'll check back if if you're seeing it and I'm not seeing it. Yesterday we had a little glitch connecting. So I want to make sure. I don't know. Darn. Looks like we should be connected. Are you entertained? <laughs> it's like, ah, this is not what I want to hap have happening, right? So I don't see any comments. If you're here live, oh, there we are. Oh, good. We've been live for three minutes. <laughs> So welcome again, if you just popped on, this is our master class, and I'm excited because we've got some time together this afternoon to be learning with and from each other. I have um, quite a few different strategies and advocacy mantras that we want to cover today. If I haven't met you yet, I was going to um, just give you a little bit of a taste of where I come from. And so if you can think back to, um, I'll take you back in time and we're going to pretend like this is 1988. And have you ever had one of those dark days? And it's like, please help me just get through this day. Well, I remember one day my husband and I were leaning over our son's bed in the neo and intensive care unit in the hospital. And I was trying to see past all those tubes and needles and machines that surrounded him. And to be able to see that sweet little baby that I knew. And what was so hard is the doctor had told us, you know, because of his respiratory problems, 
if he can make it through the first 48 hours, we will be more optimistic that he'll be able to make it. And it was like, what? And then the doctor went on to talk about, you know, we suspect Down syndrome, we're going to be doing some testing, you know, and they needed our consent for that. And it was like, sure, fine, that's great, yes. Well, I remember 50 hours after our son was born and we were back at the hospital leaning over his crib there and just neither one of us knew what we were gonna ask or say to the doctor that day. But when the doctor approached us, I knew it was past those 48 hours. And so I looked at my husband, hoping he would ask the question. And luckily he did. He said, you know, you said the first 48 hours were the most critical. What do you think? Do you think Dylan's gonna make it? And the doctor quickly answered yes. So that was like a huge relief, right? And he said, of course, we're cautiously optimistic at this time. Well, as a parent, it was like, you know, I can handle my son having Down syndrome, but having my son die is not something I wanna have to try and deal with. So that began, or began our journey on this special ed path. And I'm sure that many of you have similar stories. And I think that's the bond that we have as parents because only another parent of a child with a disability truly understands what every day is like. But hopefully, as a parent of a child with a disability, you also know there is so many joyful times, right? And those are the times we want to capitalize on, capitalize on because there are so many wonderful things. And we know that as a mom or a dad, and we want the school to know that. We want the school to start building on our child's strengths. And that's what I'm passionate about. If you don't know me, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm obviously a parent, a retired teacher, and author of a number one best-selling Amazon book, um, and an advocate and a public speaker. So again, welcome for being here today. I'm going to do a quick check and make sure we have, if you're, I do say we have some live viewers. So if you can go ahead and type in the comment box so that I can say hi to you. But you know, when I started on the special ed journey as a parent, even though I was a special ed teacher, I found it was like so different. <laughs> And one of the things that was hard for me was keeping track of everything. I mean, all the paperwork, all the dates that I was supposed to be here or there, right? So one of the first things I wanna share with you is a chart that I came up with. And unfortunately, I didn't think of this until I was an advocate. <laughs> As a parent, I was, trying to kind of go bonkers, trying to figure everything out. So let me show you this um, tool that I came up with. And if you're interested in it, you can just um, type in time in the comment box because this is all about, oops, I missed some slides of Dylan getting older. <laughs> um, but this is, to me, a time saver. So if you want the time saver tool, just type time in the comment box. Um, but what I tried to do was think about all the things, all the steps that need to happen before an IEP meeting. And instead of getting down to the last couple days and the meeting's coming up and you're kind of feeling in a panic, I wanted to show you an idea of a timeline that you could use. Now you have to understand that I'm like a real detailed person. 
<laughs> so it's like, Charmaine, this is like way too detailed for me. And if it is, then you take it and you figure out how to tweak it and make your own. Um, and because I'm a detailed person, one of the first tasks that I have on here that you'll see is to focus on the big picture, because that's what I have to remind myself. So before you go into the IEP meeting, you know, weeks before the IEP meeting, remember what's most important and focus on that big picture. And then the next task to do is to revisit your vision. And this, I think, is really important to share at each and every one of your IEP meetings, what your vision is for your child. And, you know, that can be like, what is life going to look like when he graduates from high school or she graduates from high school? And, you know, what kind of college opportunities do you want? What kind of jobs do you think they might want to pursue? Where are they going to live? You know, different things like you want to have that big vision and have every IEP help you one step closer to getting to your vision. And I really think six weeks out is kind of a good um, space to do that in as far as start thinking about this before um, the IEP meeting actually comes up. <laughs> And then the third task I have is to think outside the conference room. Um, and often when we go to IEP meetings, it's in the school building, it's in a conference room, or maybe the library, or maybe the classroom. Um, but what we wanted to do when Dylan was young was to make sure that the staff had a good picture of who Dylan is. And so before our IEP meeting, I talked to the principal and the special ed teacher, and we made arrangements where his IEP meeting could be at our house. And it was like so wonderful. I mean, the staff came over to the house. Dylan was playing in the living room with his dogs and his toys. We had an IEP meeting in our living room. I mean, you can bring a computer to type on, or you can bring the IEP form and fill it out. And so I encourage parents to think outside of that conference room. Um, what happened is it was like such a great way for people to be introduced to Dylan who hadn't met him. They could watch what he was doing. He was still, you know, within <laughs> our site. So we could always remember this is the little guy that we're writing these goals for. Um, and so when he was in kindergarten, then we had our our um, IEP meeting at that time in his kindergarten classroom. And yes, we had to sit on little chairs, <laughs> but Dylan could be in the reading center and doing different things in the kindergarten class while we were having the meeting. And he was at his IEP meeting and he didn't sit at the table, but we would glance over and we would say, Dylan, who were some of your friends at school? And Dylan would give us names. And so it was like he still had input. So these kinds of things don't happen unless you plan ahead of time. So think outside of that conference room. You don't have to always be there. Um, go to the classroom if the um, students are in a, you know, art, music, PE or something and the classroom is available. Try to do it in a different location and you'll be amazed how the tone of the meeting changes. So if you have, um, done IEP meetings in a different place instead of a conference room. Why don't you comment, because I'm not seeing any comments here, guys, <laughs> um, and let us know or where you usually have IEP meetings. So let's go back and look at some other to do things before the meeting that really make a difference. Um, I always say, take time now to save time later. <laughs> I think IEP meetings should be scheduled for at least two hours. Um, and if you end early, everybody's excited, right? But it's unrealistic, I think, especially if you've got topics of concern or you need more discussion on, to be able to write 
a well-written IEP in an hour, unless you do a lot of prep work um, beforehand, and, and that can happen too. Um, but I say when the IEP is coming up, about six weeks before the IEP is due, you contact the special ed teacher and say, you know, can we get a two-hour slot of time? So when they look at their schedule, they know that's how much time they need to block out for, for your child's IEP meeting. Um, I've heard some people say, like, we had an IEP meeting in a half an hour. It's like, really? I don't know how that would work. Um, another task to do is to find out who's coming. So on your letter of invitation or notice of meeting that you get, <clears throat> usually you only get that about 10 days ahead of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm thinking it really helps if about a month before the IEP is due that you have a conversation with a special ed teacher about who's going to be attending. Um, you want to make sure it's at least one general ed teacher and a general ed teacher that knows your child um, because they're the ones that are going to have the most input. You need to um, share with the staff if you're going to bring a friend or an advocate. Technically, you don't have to tell them that. I just think that's a courtesy. You want to know who's coming from the school. Um, and it's nice for you to also tell them who you're inviting it. So the next, next task might be like your least favorite thing to do before an IEP meeting, but it's file it. <laughs> you got to start organizing your kids' records. And um, I do have a video. I can put it in our uh, description of the video later about organizing records. Um, I do it in a way that Pete Wright from Wright's Law teaches and other attorneys that I've worked with teach, and I organize records according to date, so they're all in a chronological order versus in categories like evaluation tab, IEP tab, and but anyway, um, I'll put the link in for that video and you can check that out. But you want to be organized with your records. Otherwise, there's no way to keep track of everything, right? Um, and you need to go back. I like to go back at least a couple years when I'm getting ready for an IEP meeting and see what the students' IEPs, previous IEPs were. Um, and if you have your files record or your files and your records all organized, it makes it a lot easier to be able to do that. You want to go back and look at what scores they had on a variety of tests or evaluations, look at what they're doing now, see if there's been any progress <laughs> or how much progress there's been made. Um, so all of that you want to start doing about a month before your IEP meeting. And then I say three weeks before the meeting to start talking about how you're going to involve your child in the IEP. And, you know, different parents have different, you know, ways that they want to do it, and that is totally fine. You know your child best, so you need to individualize that. We always had Dylan come to his meetings ever since age three. We had some meetings where it was pretty contentious, and no, we didn't invite Dylan to come to those meetings. Um, but some parents have their kids come at the beginning, some at the end. Sometimes um, older students will um, make a PowerPoint or something like that. And that would be a way that they can share information about themselves. So I'm just checking. This, um, Susan from Denver is here. Hey, Susan. Um, <clears throat> She's, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, she says she has identical pictures of her daughter. Um, and we had her on do not resuscitate orders for three weeks after her lungs collapsed. So, yeah, so she's talking about that picture I showed of Dylan in intensive care. And um, that's the, those are memories that she has of uh, her daughter. So Cynthia Hall is on with us. Hey, Cynthia. And Oh, I love her ideas. Look here. So when we were talking about changing the location and not just going to the conference room, she said community centers, the central office, 
parent job location or in staff rooms. Yeah, so that's great, Cynthia. She's thinking outside of the conference room, right? Um, and and that's the thing. I mean, and sometimes it changes because it's more of a relaxed um, situation, especially like if maybe you're in the classroom. Um, and if you go to central office, sometimes that's perceived as a little more, I don't know, formal, but also the central office of the district could be perceived as a little bit more neutral versus right in the school building. So think about, you know, your relationship with the staff and, um, and just the tone that you want to set for the meeting. And you don't always have to go to the place that they typically have IEP meetings. Or if you're in Texas, they call them ARG meetings, right? And Marlo's on with this. Hey, Marlo. Um, yeah, she was like back 1988. I know it's like maybe some of the people on this call weren't even born in 1988, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just another way that I that I date myself. Um, so anyway, I want you to plan how you're going to involve your child. And when they're younger, it's going to be less involvement. But as they get older, like upper elementary school, they should start sitting at the table for, this is my opinion, for at least a little bit and having some input on, you know, what's easy at school, what's hard at school, what goals they would like to set for themselves. Um, because when they get to middle school, that's a time that they can actually be co-facilitating IEP meetings. Um, and in high school, they can be the facilitator at their own meeting. So what we want to build are those self-advocacy skills, and we do it you know, in little baby steps, depending on our kids. If they use communication devices, we want to make sure the communication devices are programmed with input that they can have at the meeting. Um, you can bring photos. You can, like I said, have your child do a PowerPoint about themselves, about what they want to learn at school. Um, so start thinking about that about three weeks before the IEP meeting is scheduled, and then you'll have time to help your kid make that PowerPoint or something like that, right? The other thing to look at two to three weeks before your meeting is, can you schedule some pre-meetings with teachers at school? And this really helps the whole process of writing a new IEP be a lot more efficient. Um, I have a friend and she's been doing a wonderful job of collaboratively writing a draft IEP with um, the teachers. So if Selena is watching the replay, shout out to Selena because she does an awesome job helping the teachers write strengths-based IEPs for her daughter. Um, so two or three weeks before the meeting, Try to see if you can sit down either individually with teachers or a small group of the general ed and the special ed teacher. And if there's a pair that provides support, you want those key people and you start brainstorming um, before you get any draft IEP from the school. So now we're getting a little bit closer to your meeting time, right? So let's look at some other things you can get organized. So again, two to three weeks before the meeting, start thinking about who you're gonna bring. Do you wanna bring um, a relative who really knows your son well or your daughter well? Do you wanna bring a friend that is just like supportive and you just feel like you need that emotional support, which is fine, because we all do. Um, do you want to bring somebody like an advocate? You want to be able to schedule that ahead of time, um, even though I know as an advocate, I try to be as flexible when I get um, phone calls and the IEP is just a few days away. But if you are considering bringing somebody, you need to start giving them notice so they can get it on their calendar. At least a week before the IEP meeting, I think it's great to get a draft and read it over, mark questions, you know, comments on it. 
make a list of your questions that you want to talk about when you're at the IEP meeting. I also think it's great if parents would write reports. I mean, everybody else sitting at that IEP t um, table usually has a report to offer. And it's like the parent sits there and maybe they ask the parent for some input. But as an equal member of the IEP team, you can write down things and ask that your report be embedded in the IEP. Um, and when I say embedded, I want it written right in those boxes on the form like everybody else's report is. Um, I really caution parents not to have IEP or their comments or anything like that stapled and say, oh, it's going to be attached to the IEP because usually that attachment isn't in the computer in the district and it really isn't part of your child's record then. So write a report. It can just be bullet points, but you need to talk about your concerns, your vision, what goals you think are appropriate, help them understand different nuances of your child and how um, accommodations and workarounds that you do at home could be helpful at school. All of that information that you have, you just have such richness <laughs> in your brain and you want to be able to share that and you want it to be documented in the IEP. So, and then the last thing before the IEP meeting is to just try to get there wherever the location is about 15 minutes ahead of time. You know, you want to make sure you've got a buffer of time for parking, for walking in the building, for figuring out where exactly you're going, signing in if you need to do that, if you need to take a bathroom break before you go in or fill up your water bottle. So try to arrive at IEP meetings a little bit early so, you know, it's not like that rushed and hectic kind of feel of like, oh my gosh, am I going to be late? So let me look and see if we have any more comments in here. So yeah, just keep typing in your comments or your questions and we'll get them answered. So let's move on here. So all the things that we're talking about today, I consider advocacy tools. <laughs> So I want to help you today to get some new advocacy tools for your toolbox because the one thing that I'm really passionate about is to help parents be more effective advocates so their children are safe and happy and learning every day at school, okay? So I have this little sign here that says, got advocacy tools? <laughs> And I actually bought a toolbox. <laughs> and here are a couple of advocacy tools we're going to use in a few minutes. But I have a whole toolbox in here of things that I think is really helpful for parents to have. So as we go through our um, session today, we'll be talking more about the advocacy tools that you need for your toolbox. So. If you want, in the comments, type in what are some important tools that you have right now that you use when you're advocating for your child or, as we have some advocates on with us too, when you are advocating for students, what are some important tools that you want to make sure that you have? So type that in because the more interactive we are, the I think the more engaging it will be for all of us. And then we learn so much from each other, right? So when Dylan was three years old, I told you we had his first IEP meeting in our living room. Um, and we were excited because I had gone and heard speakers like Judith Snow and Norman Coons and Marsha Forrest and wonderful self advocates from Canada and self advocates from the United States that I met. And it was like, yes, we're going to have this inclusive life for Dylan because that is the value that we have as a family. 
And, you know, because both my husband and I were special ed teachers, all of our friends were saying, you know, it's going to be easy for you, easy. And that's one of my first uh, advocacy tools here. <laughs> so they said, you know, both you and Jim are special ed teachers. That was easy. And guess what? It wasn't easy. <laughs> so sometimes this advocacy tool is the one that gets used the least, and we want to help change that for you. So what we found when Dylan was turning three is we had this vision that he would go to a community preschool. The school district had an entirely different um, vision. They wanted him to go to a special ed preschool. Um, so as, as a result, <laughs> I kind of reverted to my high school debate team <laughs> attitude, and I thought, you know, I'm this debater. We're going to debate this, and we're going to, you know, win, and Dylan's going to go to the community preschool. Well, guess what? My debating skills didn't get me very far in those first IEP meetings. And my husband and I then made the decision, you know, this was something critical for Dylan, for him to start in inclusive settings when he was three years old. So what we decided to do was, you know, the debating isn't working, so we'll file for due process. Now, filing for due process is not something you want to take lightly. Um, it's something that, it's not only expensive in money, but in time and emotional turmoil. So you have to be really cautious and don't be, you know, I've heard some parents be flippant, well, I'll just file for a due process, you know, and it's like, no, <laughs> you have to really evaluate things, make sure you have an attorney that knows special ed law, all those good things. Well, we filed for due process, around the, top, the issue of least restrictive environment. And luckily, we were able to settle at mediation, and the district did agree that Dylan would attend the um, community preschool. They had an early childhood teacher that would um, go out once a week to touch base with the preschool teachers that he had um, to observe him, see how things were going. And it just, it turned out to be a wonderful year um, and Dylan developed friendships that he kept like through high school and beyond. So it was like just exactly what we wanted to have happen, right? Um, and I'm, let's see, I don't know. Um, so if you have to do something besides continuing to go to IEP meetings, that is something that you need to get advice about. Um, most states now have facilitated IEP meetings. And so often if you're kind of at a standstill, you can ask for a facilitated IEP meeting. And oftentimes that neutral person there to kind of lead the process can make a huge difference. So. I don't know if um, if any of our live viewers or people watching the replay have experience going to things like um, a facilitated meeting and what your what your outcomes were. So I also see we have Jeannie is here. So welcome, Jeannie. Um, keep writing your comments and questions as we go along here. So this was a picture of um, Dylan's community preschool class, some of his classmates, like I said, that he um, kept friends with for a number of years. This is his cute graduation picture, right? Every PowerPoint needs a cute preschool graduation picture. <laughs> and then here he was. He was included from preschool all the way through high school. He earned a letter jacket for um, academics, and luckily we were in a school that looked at 
his achievement according to the effort and the progress that he was making on his IEP goals. And based on that, he was an awarded an academic letter and got a letter jacket, so he was very proud of himself. And after high school, his goal was to go to college, and that took a whole nother level of advocacy. Um, but we were successful there, and Dylan went on to audit classes at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So the reason why I share these things is to show you that um, your advocacy is going to take lots of twists and turns, and it's going to be something that's a continuous journey. And oftentimes as parents, we feel guilty, like, ah, I should have done that, or how come I didn't know that sooner? And I don't want you beating yourself up because we only can do what we know at that time. And so as you're going on Facebook Live shows like this, as you're learning more information, yes, then that's gonna help you do more. But try to dismiss <laughs> those guilt feelings of, ah, why didn't I know this 10 years ago? Um, because it's okay. And you'll just continue on your journey. And your child will probably still need some advocacy from you and some support from you as a mom or dad after high school, right? Just like our kids without disabilities, they still need to rely on us for some kinds of support and help, right? So the more you learn now, the better impact that will have on your child's life after high school. And that's one of those big goals that we want to keep focus on, is to have that rich, inclusive, happy life after high school. And lots of opportunities, lots of choices that they can make. So if this is resonating with you, give us a thumbs up or give us some love so we know we're on the right path and this is like making sense. And um, if you're like, going, what is she talking about? I've never heard of such things. <laughs> you can type that in there too, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that that we'll get back and forth engagement during our masterclass because my intent is not just to be here to, <laughs> you know, be the only one with the voice in the room. So feel free to Bop in and uh, let us know. So this kind of goes along with what we were just talking about is please do not feed the fears. Um, and sometimes in some days that's easier than others, but um, we do want to focus on the positive and all the possibilities. So if you're willing to stop feeding those fears and learn some new things, you're in the right place because here we believe in possibilities. We're not gonna be that master debater anymore. We're gonna learn more collaborative skills. And we do that by beefing up our listening skills and our ability to ask different kinds of clarifying questions. And that makes a huge difference. And we'll talk about those kinds of questions here in a minute. You're gonna be learning today to stop drawing drawing <clears throat> that line in the sand, or sometimes it seems like we're drawing a ditch in the sand instead of just a line. And instead, we're gonna be drawing a circle of understanding. And we're gonna to try to take each other's perspective and use that as a positive way to move forward. And so in a minute, we'll be talking about understanding the difference between positions and interests, um, because this is kind of at the heart of things when you find yourself in disagreement with um, school staff. We're going to try to decrease those times where it's just like so maddening. It's like, ah, why are they doing this? And instead, we're going to learn a technique and I'm gonna share with you an email template, but it's also a great template to use during verbal conversations. And it's about using 
more compassion with our communication. And that doesn't mean being an easy pushover, but the email template that I'm gonna share with you is um, based on, you know, research as far as what are effective ways that we can be assertive and get our point across and be specific and ask for something specific um, without becoming too aggressive or without being too passive. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes too. It's a, it's a pretty cool email template that you can use. So have you ever been in those IEP meetings or ARD meetings if you're in Texas and everybody's talking at once? It, it's like The View, right, <laughs> that TV show? Well, that is really hard to come to any kind of, you know, conclusion or anything. So instead, one of the strategies that I would like you to help you learn is Instead of that, just kind of talking back and forth and getting into this argument or debate, is to learn to ask more clarifying questions um, and to listen more with curiosity, which I just love that phrase, um, listen with curiosity. <laughs> I think it just gives like this whole other picture. Um, and actually, most of these questions in here are taken from the, the book that I wrote, um, The Art of Advocacy, and I'll stop sharing my PowerPoint here for a minute, but um, in chapter two of my book, The Art of Advocacy, there's all kinds of examples of probing questions, clarifying questions, um, how to listen more with curiosity. Um, so you might want to um, look at that. And it's on Amazon. You can buy the Kindle for just 99 cents. So that's pretty cool. But let's look at some examples of those questions. And here we go. One of the first questions is, can you show me some examples? So when the teacher is saying your child's making great progress in math, you can say, can you show me some examples? Because sometimes what the teacher says is great progress is like, no, actually, he was doing this last year in math, too. Um, so, but before you kind of get defensive, <laughs> if you can ask them to bring examples or samples of your child's work to the IEP meeting, that can be really helpful. Or you can ask, can you tell me why it was done that way? And again, your tone of voice is going to either make this really aggressive or your tone of voice can make it be more curious, but not aggressive, right? <laughs> we want assertive, not aggressive. So can you tell me why it was done that way? It's like, I don't know. what. Why did you choose to do that? Um, you know, it's like the child, instead of... Um, going to PE class is said, no, you can't go. You've got to sit here and finish your homework. And you might be like raging inside because it's like, what? <laughs> they can't go to PE because of some math homework. Um, and instead of reacting that way, if you can try to take a deep breath and instead say, can you tell me why it was done that way? Um, and that can be a helpful question to keep conversation going. And there's, you know, like I said, um, the book where you can get more information. So the second strategy we're going to talk about is not drawing that line in the sand, or sometimes it looks like a, dirt, a ditch in the sand. And you get stuck on my way and your way. And this is not just parents. I mean, we all know that there's um, staff that get stuck in it's the school's way, and we're not going to talk about your way at all. Um, so instead, I want to give you a glimpse into, try to help you understand that if instead of that line in the sand, we draw a circle of understanding, that your child will benefit. And I don't want you to feel like, oh, it sounds like Charmaine's 
trying to tell us to sell our kids out and, you know, take what's not right for our kids. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we've got to come up with techniques that are going to help us build relationships because that's when our kids are going to be, um, have the most benefit, right? So if um, you look at what the difference is and you know, some people feel like, wow, if you're at an IEP meeting, you shouldn't be negotiating. You shouldn't have to negotiate your child's rights away. Well, I think this um, definition of negotiation is really helpful when we look at the IEP process. So we're going to be asking everybody at the IEP team to be open-minded and to look at what people's underlying interests are because the position is what we want but the underlying interest is why we want something so we're going to talk about negotiating the why but not giving away the what and if this all sounds confusing we'll talk about it here <laughs> so if you think about an iceberg the tip of the iceberg are is equivalent to the positions that people take. It's like, no, I want my child to have a one-on-one -on -one aid. That's my position. Well, what we need to see is that underlying part of the iceberg under the ocean, and we need to understand where they're coming from, what their interests are. So I like to use the example of a parent asking for a one-on-one -on -one because I get a lot of questions as an advocate. Parents will call me up and say, what do you think? I, I asked for a one-on-one -on -one aid and they said no and da, 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 da. And it's like, so what I wanna find out when I talk to a parent and I, what I hope that the school would wanna find out is if your goal is for your child to have a one-on-one -on -one aid, let's understand what is underneath that <laughs> and why you are feeling so strongly that your child needs that one-on-one -on -one aid. And what I find a lot when I talk to parents is that they're worried. They're worried their child's gonna get lost out on the playground, scramble through that fence opening and get lost. So they want a one-on-one -on -one aid to make sure their child is safe. Or they're so worried because it's like, ah, my child is falling behind and reading is so frustrating for him. I want a one-on-one -on -one aid to help him with his reading. Or a parent is saying, I don't want other kids bullying my, my child. I want a one-on-one -on -one aid to make sure that he doesn't get bullied at school. So then to me, the conversation is, how do we keep your child safe? Make sure that he doesn't escape through the fence on the playground. Maybe having a one-on-one -on -one aid is one way we could reach that goal. So now the goal becomes, how do we keep my child safe at school versus the goal of, I want a one-on-one -on -one aid. And that's what helps when you look beneath what people are saying and try to understand where they're coming from. Now, if your child is struggling in reading and you think a one-on-one -on -one aid is gonna be helpful, to me, the goal is how do we help your child be more successful, make more progress in reading? Maybe having a one-on-one -on -one pair could help. But I bet there's other ways we could help your child with reading. So again, the goal is not that demand that the parent is making, I want a one-on-one -on -one aid. The goal here would be, how do we make sure your child is progressing in reading? So do you see the difference between positions and interests? And I'm gonna pause here um, because I would love to get some conversation going. Also, if you see um, 
on the Visions and Voices page just under our video, there's a link. If you want to click on that link and come on camera with us, you're invited to do that. Um, or if you just want to do the comments, and I'm going to try and catch up because it looks like we've got quite a few comments. So um, let's look here. So Nancy um, is responding to Lisa. So maybe I should read Lisa's first, right? <laughs> so let's get back here. Well, yeah, Al and Lisa have joined us. And Nancy says, um, if you don't have an IEP binder, um, it's helpful. So yeah, so some kind of a notebook to organize things. And like I said, I'll leave the link after the show of a video that I did on organizing all your files. And Yael says, yes, that's all correct. They've got the draft all done. No reason why you can't get it now. So she must have been asking. Um, I got a one-on-one -on -one aid, just like the lawyer guy that hosted Yael said. He was so right. They gave it to me for behavioral to tame their problem. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, I want to say that when I was using that example of a parent demanding a one-on-one -on -one aid and to look at what the underlying interests are, you know, to me, if there's underlying interests of, you know, my child is communicating through his behavior that he's really frustrated, that he's upset, you know, this is impacting him, we do need some other expertise in here to help my child. There are times and places, my son had um, para support. It was assigned to the class, not just to him. But yeah, I mean, there are times when our kids need extra support at school, and I wholeheartedly support that. Um, I guess the point that I was hoping to make is that we always want to look at that underlying reason, and if it's for behavioral reasons, for sure we want to talk about that as a team and make sure that our child's getting their support. So Nancy Brown says, the work example that was provided at my child's IEP meeting was lots of support, oh, was with lots of support after, after I questioned it and had my own example. Yes, yes, that's a great um, comment and I can stop screen sharing here. Um, that's a good comment. And I just was talking with a mom and she said that the teacher had brought a handwriting sample and she knew <laughs> that was not her child's handwriting. Um, and so if you have samples of your child's work, just like the teachers are bringing in samples and having a report, you bring in your samples, you bring in your report um, and compare the two. Um, and if, you know, he's doing better at school than at home, try to figure out, you know, is it a certain handwriting paper? Is it a certain handwriting program? Um, you know, so it's not always to kind of feel like we're going to, you know, get the teacher like, ah, I gotcha. <laughs> Um, but it's to try to share and it's like, wow, you know, if we find one way that works, hey, let's share that and make sure everybody on the team knows that. But yeah, you can, you can show, or there are a lot of times during IEP meetings when, you know, you just wonder if sometimes the staff is inflating the progress that your child is making. Um, yeah, so Nancy's saying you should have your own examples too. She said, yeah, she was, Lisa was saying that um, her meeting got postponed until November 7th, so she could ask now. Yeah, so for sure. I think that's what Yael was saying is that the draft is done, so you should be able to get a copy of that. Um, so Nancy also says, I would suggest asking 10 days prior knowing you will probably only get it a couple days prior. I think appealing to efficiency is helpful for everyone to see the value. You can also ask for two meetings to be set so that you have time to review it. Or you could just sit and at the end and then um, let them, let's see, and let them, you will be reading it, uh, oh, and letting them know that you'll be reading it over, as one advocate has stated very, very slowly. Um, 
Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, it's, um, I think, unreasonable to expect to give a parent a draft right there during the meeting when everybody else has had time to write it and read it. Um, so you do want to ask for draft IEPs, and more parents are doing that, and more teachers are understanding that it does help the meetings be more efficient. Um, and if you can get it a couple weeks ahead of time, I worked with several parents that they would get the IEP a couple weeks ahead of time and then have time to write comments or questions back to the teacher, and the draft could be revised before we got to the IEP meeting. Or, like I said, a two or three weeks before your meeting, if you could have pre-discussions with the team, um, not make, of course, any formal decisions because you're not at a formal IEP meeting, but together to write that draft IEP instead of waiting and being on the receiving end, be more of an equal partner and help the teachers actually draft the IEP, which I don't think happens um, very often. So for sure, when you start asking um, people to do things that they're not used to doing, you're going to get some pushback. But as Nancy suggested, if you can show the benefit to them, then they're more likely to um, respond in a positive way. So that's really helpful. So thanks, guys, um, for chiming in. The other thing that you want to do is ask more open-ended questions. Um, because this, again, the whole purpose is to keep the conversation going versus getting to those roadblocks. So this is my favorite, it's not actually a question, but it's my favorite um, new thing <laughs> that I've tried to start using more when I'm having conversations at IEP meetings. And it's just the two words, so that. So if a teacher is saying, you know, we're going to recommend that his service time be decreased from 900 to 750 minutes, and then you can just add so that, and you just kind of leave it as this hanging sentence. But it's great because that's a way you can understand their rationale, and that can also be a, a way that you understand their un underlying position. Um, so if they're, um, you know, making any kind of recommendation at the IEP table and you're not quite sure why, just add those two words so that, or they say, you know, we're going to take away one elective and we're going to give him more direct instruction in math instead of having that elective. And then you say, so that, and you pause and you wait and you wait for them to answer. Because too many times what I see is parents ask questions and they don't wait for that pregnant pause, which can be really helpful and really strategic. The teachers might feel like they're on the spot, but guess what? They're the ones that are supposed to be having the information to share with you. They don't just get to make recommendations without it being a discussion. So that open-ended question, which isn't a question, <laughs> that phrase, so that can be like super helpful to have in your repertoire. So anybody have a comment on that? I think um, I'm glad we've got an active group here. Yay, yay, yay. And also, you can share this video with friends, right? Um, so let's go into this strategy of what do we do when we're, like, beyond angry? Um, oops, I'm going backwards. Let me go forward here. So one of the things that I told you is that I would share today an email template that I use, and it's really, really helpful, not only for email, but you can use it for verbal conversation. Um, and it's a concept around compassionate communication. And if you want to know more about this, just type in 
compassionate communication and the comment box because it's based on some different um, research that if you're interested in that, I can um, share the link with you. But basically, I look at, at it as beyond the iMessage. Now, if you are old enough to have grown up, I think, in the 60s or the 70s, where iMessages were like the thing for communication, where you would say, I feel I, and not blame the other person, like, you make me so angry. Well, this template that I use, and I suggest that parents use for emails or conversations, I've added a couple little twists to it, and I call it the beyond the eye message. So step one is you start with something positive, and you have to be sincere. Um, and sometimes step one is hard <laughs> if you're like at odds with people and you can't think of something positive. But we all want to hear positive things about our kids. Teachers want to hear positive things about themselves and the work that they're doing. So think of something positive, start your email with that. The second thing you're going to do is to say what you observed. So this is no judgments, which is the hard part, right? Um, especially if you're upset about something, but you want to say factual things that you actually observed or that you know to be true. The third step is to say how you feel. So this is when we bring in those feelings. So we're not going to just talk about this logically, but we are going to recognize and honor the feelings that you have. And I'll give an example of how these steps look in real life. <laughs> the fourth step to the email template is to talk about what needs you have. The fifth step is to make a clear request. So don't just end your email and feel like, oh, great, I, I got this chance to vent, and now I'm really happy I got this chance to vent. No, we want to make a request. Are you requesting more examples of work? Are you requesting a date for the IEP team to meet? Are you requesting an evaluation? Put that in your email. Make sure it's a clear request. And then at the end, you're going to, again, think of something positive. Um, so let me show you an example of this beyond the iMessage. So we're going to start with positive, and here we go. We're so happy Jason had some friends at school this year. Thanks for helping facilitate that. Here's an observation. Non-judgmental is the key. We have also noticed when Jason comes home from school, he has the same homework that everyone else does. How you feel. My husband and I feel frustrated when Jason's homework isn't being modified like it says in his IEP. Connect your feelings to your needs. Making sure Jason is successful is important to us, as I'm sure it is to you. Make your clear request. We would like to set up a meeting with Jason's classroom and special education teachers so we can talk about ways to make sure the needed modifications are happening. And then end with positive. Thanks for your support, and we look forward to working together with the teachers. So if, um, I thought I had a slide with it all together. <laughs> But basically, those would be the sentences that you would use for each step in that email template. Um, so, yeah, if you want, I, I call it, I think I made it into like an ebook, and so I call it Be Heard at IEP meetings. So if you want to get that template, you could just type in Be Heard um, in the comments, and I'll make sure that I get you to the link to the email template. But like I said, once you kind of get used to using that as a template, um, then it, it comes more natural. So even when you're having conversations in person with people, that you kind of mentally go through those steps. And Terry's here. Hey, Terry. Um, she said, I asked to attend the before the IEP meeting, and they agreed. But it was really about his behavior plan, and the IEP wasn't discussed. Yeah, so I know. And that's like one of those keys, too, is like 
when you're invited to a meeting and especially if um, you know you're not quite sure exactly all the things that are going to be discussed is to ask for an agenda ahead of time and if they put on the agenda all kinds of IEP things but they only talk about the behavior plan then you could say so when are we going to meet before the meeting before the official IEP to talk about all the other things on the agenda um, so asking for an agenda ahead of time is like great too. Um, I have parents call me and want me to come to an IEP meeting with them, which I do, um, either in person or on the phone, um, if they live far away from me. And I say, you know, so what kind of meeting is this? And it, they go, oh, it's an IEP meeting. And I said, okay, so is it to review the previous IEP? Is it, you know, a special IEP meeting you call for a certain issue and they said well I, I don't know the teacher said we were having an IEP meeting and so I say did you get a letter of notice did you get an invitation well no but they said they were going to do it next Thursday it's like no you need to write him back and, and make that clear request about you know exactly what the meeting is going to be about who's going to be there all those details um so yeah, asking for an agenda, asking for who's going to be there, it just gives you the time to be um, mentally um, prepared. So Cynthia typed in "be heard." So yes, Cynthia, I'll give you um, I'll give you the link to that little e-book that I wrote, and I just find it like a really useful um, tool. And I know we had one mom um, that I just sent it to the other day. And I'm hoping, she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to be here live, but if she comes back and watches the replay, I hope that she'll type in what her experience was because she used that template for the first time the other day. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing her feedback with that. So those are some strategies that you can use. Um, we talked about going from being a debater to a collaborator, <laughs> to go from kind of making judgments and getting stuck on, you know, arguing over positions and learning how to identify the underlying interests. That was our second strategy. We also had the strategy that we just talked about as far as um, a more compassionate but also assertive way of communicating with the school. So we're going to go into some mantras that I want to just roll off your tongue. <laughs> so these are some things that I have found helpful. Um, so I'm going to quickly share them with you. One of my advocacy mantras is show me the data. <laughs> um, and people that were in our recent five day challenge, we had a whole session on um, figuring out progress monitoring, the data, the progress reports, but basically you want to make sure there's objective data. Um, and then the other part is you want to be able to know how to interpret the data once they show it to you. So that's where having a friend come in who understands that or an advocate that understands it because they can show you a pretty graph with colored lines and dots, but it could be junk data. Um, and so you got to not only request that they bring data to the IEP meeting, but then you need to either ask them to explain it or have somebody with you that can help you understand, is my child really making progress? What does all of this really mean? Now, another mantra that I like to use is, what would it take? So this is helpful when the district is like, or the school is like, no, you know, this is how we've always done it. It's worked fine. We're, we're not up to making any changes. And so what you could say is, what would it take for my daughter to be able to go to PE class even if she hasn't turned in her math homework. What would it take? And then you pause and you wait for a response and then you start having a conversation and a discussion. But just ask, what would it take? 
This one is probably one of the first mantras I learned as an advocate. <laughs> Show me the policy, statute, or regulation. Because we know so many times the school might say to a parent, oh, well, that's our policy on observations. You know, you have to do this if you want to make an observation. And one of the things that you want to come back and ask for clarification, oh, I'd love to see that policy. I want to make sure that I'm following it. Please email me a copy of your observation policy. Now, most schools do have observation policies, but sometimes they don't, or they're talking about a different subject. Or, no, I'm sorry, the state says we can't do that. We used to do that. We can't do that anymore. That's what the state says. And then you can say, gosh, I didn't know that changed. Could you point me in the right direction? I would love to be able to read that state regulation. So don't assume just because they say it's a policy, a statute, or a regulation that it really exists. Call them on that and ask them to show you, to email you a copy of it. So the last mantra I wanna leave you with is all children can learn. And I hope you embrace this because I think this is the most important value that we can bring to an IEP meeting is to share the expectation that your child is a learner and that your child is competent. So when they're questioning why you want your child included, when you're questioning why your child can't participate in something, you want to come back to all children can learn. All children, all students are competent. And pause. Because you need to make sure that you have those shared values as an IEP team. That's what's going to make the difference for your child. So we have a few minutes left here. I want to be able to share with you some ways that I can continue to support you in this journey that you're on through this special education maze, right? So let me share with you a couple of things that I've developed for parents that are going great. And it's all about advocacy tools. And I told you that um, I have my own toolbox, right, <laughs> where I keep my advocacy tools. And so what I developed is a program to help parents get those needed adv adv advocacy tools that you need for your toolbox. So it's an online class. There's nine modules. Three modules are immediately available. The first module is all about this highlight strategy that I developed, and it's like an awesome way to color code your IEP, and you can tell at a glance if it's well-written or not. You can tell at a glance what your child's strengths are, what his needs are, how much input is in the IEP, a variety of things. So module one is really a cool highlight strategy that you'll be learning. Uh, module two, I can't even talk. Module two is looking at what I call the five main sections of the IEP and to know what's supposed to go in annual goals, to know what's supposed to go in accommodations and modifications and how to make those things really specific. And then module three, um, which I love, is all about the nine different types of intelligences because your child is intelligent. And chances are they are intelligent in other ways than we traditionally look at people we considered smart people. So it's important for us to know where our kids' strengths are, where how they learn best. And that's what module three is all about. Now, um, module four, to, four through six are coming soon. And um, module four is all about annual goals. 
and figuring out what makes a goal meaningful and also to make sure that it's understood by everybody on the team. Module five is where we drill down into modifications and accommodations and look at how they can be strategies that really work, how you can monitor the use of accommodations and modifications, figure out which ones are working, which ones aren't, because so many times accommodations are only listed and they're never really evaluated. Um, module six is looking at different kinds of supports that can be listed in the IEP, like parent training, like staff development. So that will be in module six. Module seven through nine will be talking about how to think outside of that special education room. So how can we support your child in general education, otherwise known as inclusion? And I couldn't really offer a course to parents without <laughs> some talk about inclusion. Um, and I'm sure we'll probably have a wide variety of opinions about that when we get to module seven, but um, that is something that is very worthwhile to understand and to be able to advocate for your child. Um, module eight is a new module that I inserted here and it's about prior written notice because so many parents I find don't have a great understanding of when they're supposed to get prior written notice and why does it say prior and you really get it after you've requested something. Um, but that will be module eight. Module nine is looking at how we can not only advocate for your one child to be included, but if you're interested in more of a systemic change in your district for inclusion, that will be all in module nine. So this is the online class. What I love about it is um, you can pick the time and the place that you want to tap into the modules. Like I said, the first three modules are available immediately, the other ones usually every couple of weeks will be um, um, dripped out as far as new content for you. But um, it's, you know, I find different parents sometimes are like, ooh, online class, that sounds like, uh. <laughs> but I think, it, I, I think it can be very helpful. I have a video in the online classes. We, you get the audio transcript. So if you wanna listen to it in the car, you can. Um, you get some specific advocacy steps to take, you get handouts and resources. So um, it's, I find it as like a great resource tool. And the parents that have been um, taking the course so far have also um, found it to be tremendously helpful. So if you look at the nine module class and the value of that is at least $497, but there's more. You also get these wonderful bonuses. And one of the best bonuses, I think, is you get free, um, I want to say admission, but that sounds weird. <laughs> but we have a free ongoing membership group that's held in a private Facebook group. And that membership group is just part of, um, investing in the online class. And so that's open immediately when you join. And the value of that is at least $397 because um, that's like I'm in there a couple of times a day answering your questions, you're getting ideas and answers from um, fellow members. So that's pretty awesome. There's two free mini courses as a bonus. The IEP scavenger hunt is available right now. And that was a really fun challenge that I did this summer. And all of the, um, the days, there's five days, five lessons in there about going on an IEP scavenger hunt and seeing what's working, what's not, and what's missing in your child's IEP. The other free mini course that will be coming soon is called Thinking Outside of the IEP Boxes. And I love this one. It's um, looking at other problem-solving models, um, which is 
really helpful when we're in IEP meetings because those are problem solving times. So those two free mini courses are worth at least 500, or I'm sorry, 497. You are going to be getting some done for you letters, um, templates besides the email template that I talked about. So that's at a value of 297. Um, each month, you're going to get live Q and A's, and those have already started in our group for people who joined earlier, and that's valued at $397 a year. So the total of all the bonuses is $1,588. And if you put that together with your nine module interactive course, your free membership group, your two free mini courses, your done for you letters, and your monthly Q&A calls, the total value of the course and the bonuses is $2,085. Now, I'm not going to charge you $2,085, right? That would, that would be challenging for, for families, right? So instead, what we're gonna do is, if you join us, and the advocacy tools you need for your toolbox group before Wednesday, November 1st at midnight Mountain Time, you can make a one-time payment of only $197. If you um, decide later, the price is going back up to the regular price of $497. So I think it's, a great value. Um, you are going to get rich, tested resources, best practices. You're going to get that free membership group. You're going to have a lot of support to ask specific questions, kind of have an advocate at your side. <laughs> and also, there's so many awesome parents that are already in our advocacy tools group that we are constantly learning from each other. So that one payment, one time investment, $197, I think is a bargain. Um, I realize that sometimes, you know, having extra money at the end of the month is tricky, but the other thing, so this is the link and I'll put it um, in our discussion too, but the other thing that you can do is um, have the choice of three payments of $75, for each month for three months. Here's the link for that if you want to do the three payment option. Um, and if you look above our video in the Facebook cover, I put a new um, graphic up there about advocacy tools and a yellow arrow that says click. I don't know if, so this is what um, is up on my Facebook cover. If you click on that, it will take you to a description of the course and the two links. So you have a link for the one-time payment or the link for the three payments. Um, and I'm gonna check my phone again and see if we have any other questions or input. Um, let's see. I'm not sure we have any other new questions. Usually when I got off, then I find somebody that asked a question that was like, darn, I didn't get to an answer this. Oh, here's Cynthia. Okay, so she says, let me switch off here. Um, Cynthia says, could you discuss how parents use the template when child focused is not about the feelings of parents? Often I suggest parents remain focused on framing the discussion always about the child and his or her needs. So yeah, that's a great point, Cynthia. As far as, um, you know, as advocates and as parents, we often are trained to, you know, kind of keep the adult egos <laughs> out of the discussion and instead stay really focused on the child. And I guess in the template that I suggest for parents to use a lot, it does talk about the feelings and the needs that the parents have. 
And part of that, I think, is based on the reality is, I think there's a time that that needs to be expressed. But I totally get what you're saying, Cynthia. So it's going to make me rethink, um, because I do tell parents, you know, when we're in the IEP meeting, don't say, I want this for my child. Say, my child needs, because I tell parents, the law doesn't care what you want for your child. The law only cares what your child needs. So anybody else have thoughts on that? That's a great point, Cynthia. Um, so Marlo says that she had to get the kids and she'll watch the replay. But yeah, so what do you think? Um, I'm curious. I, like I said, I just, I don't know. I guess I get the feeling that sometimes parents are like so frustrated that they need some way to express that to the school. So by doing things like expressing an observation and not making it judgmental, um, being able to say when you make your clear request that that request is based on what your child needs. So I guess what I see in that email template is um, you know, you're starting with a positive, you're talking about something that you observed, and it's a, what you observed has to do with your child, right? In that example, it was like Jason was bringing home the same homework. So I still see that email template as we are keeping it focused on, you know, in that situation, Jason's homework, but the parent gets an opportunity to talk about their feelings and the need is to make sure that their child gets the services they want. And then the clear request is what needs to happen to support that child. Um, and then ending it with a positive. So I can see how that could be interpreted, Cynthia, as, you know, are we allowing parents to be more focused on their feelings for, versus staying child focused? So one of the things that I might look at in that ebook that I'm going to send you is, and I'd love your feedback, is am I being clear that what you observed has to do with your child? Um, your feelings and your needs are about what's happening and whether or not your child's getting the support that they need at school. Your request is based on your child's needs. Um, and so to make that real clear to parents that even though they're going to have an opportunity in a couple of the steps to talk about their feelings and the needs, those feelings and needs really do come from their concern and their advocacy for the child. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, let me see if... Uh, And Cynthia, I'm not sure if you're still on. If you're still on, you could respond to that. Um, and if not, if you want to come back and reply later, um, that would work too. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate your time today. It's a Friday. I hope you're ready for a wonderful weekend. Um, like I said, the information about the online course will be um, in my Facebook group here. So you can click on the cover of my Facebook Visions and Voices Together page. Find out information about the online class. Type in any questions you have. Um, make sure that you understand that you get the online class, plus you get the free membership group, um, and you have a choice of making one payment um, for $197, or you can make three monthly payments of $75, and you can get into the course right away. Um, and I just would look forward to welcoming more parents and advocates in the group that we already have started. We had some parents that um, enrolled in our class in August, and it's been just wonderful to be able to, um, you know, feel like you're making new friends and you've got people that understand where you are coming from and that they're willing to share ideas with you. So again, I just um, hope that you have people in your space that are helping you 
to make sure that your child is safe and happy and learning every day at school. Because as an advocate, that's what I want to have happen for your child. So I'm Charmaine Tanner. Thanks for being with us. Have a gorgeous weekend. And we shall see you again soon, hopefully inside our course. Take care.